All right, good morning, everybody. Wow. <laughs> good morning, all. Wow, welcome to Amazing Grace. Everybody is super just talkative, and, and, and man, this is great. I love the energy already this morning. Uh, would you guys stand and worship with us? One second, technical difficulties. I was in the wrong key, sorry. <laughs> Oh, what a price. Oh, what a 
what a price you paid trading the highest place lay down your crown for me how great a king From death life has begun A garden from the grave Bursting through the night Yours is the victory Oh, what a price you pay Trading the highest place Lay down your crown you are and all you've done we lift you up sing this out for all you are and all you've done we lift you up lift you up for all you are and all you've done we lift praise this morning. Well, again, welcome to Amazing Grace. We're so glad that you uh, have, have joined us. If you're joining us online, thanks for joining us as well. Uh, just a couple of things. Today, um, in between services, right in here, we'll have a brief VBS meeting. VBS is 
starts next Sunday. So the next time that you're in here, you'll be in a different place. <laughs> you'll be in a jungle next week. Uh, so be prepared for that. Um, also, uh, during second service is our 401 class over here in the classrooms. Uh, and then tonight was supposed to be uh, the youth ministry color war. That has been postponed to later on in the summer, just so you're aware, if you have students that were planning on coming to that. Uh, but for now, we're going to just uh, keep worshiping our God. I count on one thing The same God that never fails He'll not fail me now He won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out Working all things out count on one thing, that God, you will never fail us. God, as, as, we, um, as we continue this morning, I pray that you would move around us, speak to us, speak through us. Father, we thank you for Jesus, that through him, death was arrested, that that you made, your love made a way to let mercy come in. Wound in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost. 
lost without hope and no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began ash was redeemed only beauty My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, so free. Washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. That's when death was arrested and my life
Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there that also is watching us online. Happy Father's Day to you. But most, most important of all, happy Father's Day to our Heavenly Father. Our scripture reading today comes from Ephesians, and I've ad lived a little bit of this. So if you're at home and start reading this scripture, it says, that's not what that scripture says. You can blame me, okay? <laughs> so uh, here we go. Fathers. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the evil devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Fathers, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm. Then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Fathers, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Fathers, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray the Spirit and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Fathers, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Shall we pray? Good morning, Father. Father, thank you so much for who you are. But Father, we just thank you so much for your son, Jesus, for the great sacrifice he made for us, Father. But Father, at this point in time right now, as we come around the table, the Jews representing the shed blood, the loaf of broken body. We can never, never, never thank your son Jesus, what he did for us. And Father, my prayer today is if there's a father sitting out there or someone else sitting out there today, as I mentioned earlier, Father, let us turn all those struggles over to you right now. And whatever it may be, family, work, jobs, whatever, Father, whatever it may be, let us turn that over to you right now and relinquish that to you and Father, let us lift it off our shoulders and let us have a great day today. And Father, we know if we can do that today, we will have comfort and peace. Thank you so much for that. We love you and we thank you and pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good morning again. Uh, and we're, I'm glad to see everybody here. Uh, this morning, uh, Tom is still on vacation, and uh, uh, we had a great uh, high school conference this past week, uh, and there was no way I was going to be able to write a sermon. Uh, so uh, we have a guest preacher here, here this morning, uh, and I'm going to introduce him. Uh, Tim, Tim Wallingford uh, is coming to us from the CCL, right, the Christian Church Leadership Network uh, in Florence, uh, the Cincinnati area. And uh, he's been here a couple of times with us, and uh, we're excited to have you here, Tim, to, to bring us the word this morning. So give it up for Tim. Hey. 
Well, it's good to be here, and uh, I really enjoyed what Randy said. Happy birthday, uh, happy Father's Day, Lord. Isn't that great? Uh, he is a good father. He's provided for us. He's cared for us. Uh, he's given us so many things. He gave us his son. And uh, so happy Father's Day, Lord. And also happy Father's Day to each father here. Um, the word uh, leader in the Greek carries this idea of journey. And so as a good leader, a good father, you are to take your family on a journey to God. We're to, sh- we're to help our families, our children, uh, our spouse, to walk in his steps and to know him. And that, that's pretty exciting that you have that responsibility to share and to introduce uh, Jesus to your family. You're to lead. Lead well. Amen? Yeah. I'd like to share with you, fathers and, and everyone else this morning, we can, it's applicable to all of us, but um, how do we lead our children to the Lord? You know, what do we say? What do we present uh, to our, our families and friends and the circle of influence that we have uh, in the community? How do we let our light shine? And what do we say as we have God conversations about the Lord, to lead them to the Lord on this journey? Well, if you have your Bibles, open to uh, Acts chapter 2, and uh, we're going to go right down through this great message uh, delivered by the Holy Spirit through Peter. It's the first gospel message delivered to the church and uh, delivered to the church. People are going to respond to Christ, and uh, it's incredible. It's a supernatural message because the Holy Spirit gives it through Peter. In Acts chapter 2, it says that uh, Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover... Uh, this group of believers had gathered in this upper room, about 120, and they were praying. All great movements happen in prayer. And so they're praying, and all of a sudden they heard this huge uh, sound like a tornado coming from the sky. And uh, it says that Jews from everywhere, of course they had gathered from all around the Roman Empire to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And it says when they heard this this noise, this, this sound, this wind, that they all came running into uh, Solomon's colonnade, a huge, huge area right outside this, this room and temple. And uh, this, this wind comes down into their house where they're staying, and uh, it divides into, into 12 different balls of fire, and then it goes into each of the 12 apostles, and they're given uh, the supernatural ability to speak in different languages and be able to share God's word. And they're going to reveal to us the new covenant, the new message. Uh, And this is Pentecost. This is the launching of the church. Now, it says here that Peter represents them in Acts uh, uh, verse 14. And so I can see the other 11 uh, disciples walking amongst the people, the crowd, because it says there there's about 16 or 17 different dialects that gather there to hear what's going on. And it mentions in verse 8, Parthenians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia. All these different Jews have come together for the Passover. And uh, it, they're, they're amazed because they hear Peter speaking in, his own la- in their own language. Now, maybe Peter is speaking in Hebrew and these 11 uh, disciples are amongst these different groups and interpreting. We're not quite sure. But he's going he's to represent uh, the disciples and speak for them. What I want you to see here is in Joel, he says, that this was prophesied 700 years before, before today, that the Holy Spirit will pour out his spirit on all people and they will preach. They will preach. They will prophesy about the Messiah. They will bring people to salvation. And then he says, this will happen before Judgment Day. And he says, but up until Judgment Day, verse 21, everybody that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So this door has been flung open to salvation, of course, through the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, as we talk about Jesus and salvation with our friends and with our families, 
and with our neighbors, the, the core thing that we want to convince them of is two things. Jesus is Lord and Savior. He is God. He is Savior. These are the two things that we convince our children, our, our spouse, our neighbors, our friends, that he is Lord and Savior. And as a father, he has delegated authority to you that you lead your children and children submit to you and follow you in the ways of God. So there's this, this responsibility that we have to promote Jesus as Lord and Savior. He is Savior when we come to him. He is Lord from that point on. And we surrender to him. We relinquish our attitudes, our priorities, our money, everything to King Jesus. He is Lord. Amen? And we share this with others, that he is Lord and Savior. Now, this message is an inductive message. In other words, Peter gives four points to prove that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Four points. I want you to write these down because you're you're an evangelist. You are responsible to make disciples. You are responsible to bring others to the Lord. And this is what we do, our family, our friends, and our circle of influence. Now, there are four proofs that you share, and you, get, you need to study a little bit in these four, and we can help you to do that. But there are four proofs that Jesus is the Lord and Savior. And then once Peter shares these four proofs, then he leads to the conclusion, therefore, therefore, he is Lord and Savior. All right, so you ready? Here we go. This is the first proof that Jesus is Lord and Savior. Uh, Number one, miracles. Look at verse 22. He says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested or proven to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. So the first thing that we need to talk to our children and family about is is miracles. Jesus was a miracle worker. And we don't talk enough about his miracles. All through the Bible, we see that when a prophet did a miracle, God was using that miracle to authenticate the message that the prophet was going to say. And so the miracles of Jesus authenticated his claim that he was God in the flesh, that he was God amongst them. God was amongst them, Emmanuel. And so miracles, we don't talk enough about miracles. We need to talk to our children about the miracles of Jesus because they communicate powerful messages of who he is. Let's take a couple miracles. Uh, Jot down Matthew chapter 9. Jesus is teaching in the midst of this uh, big, big room, and the Pharisees, religious leaders, are on the front row, and they're really watching him and making sure he doesn't say anything wrong and and uh, everybody hears this roof uh, coming apart. And you look up and uh, these four friends are lowering down their friend who was paralyzed on a mat. And when Jesus looks up and he, he sees the faith of these four men that Jesus can heal this, this friend, he looks up and says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Well, the Pharisees and Sadducees go, oh, blasphemy. Only, only God can forgive sins. And Jesus said, yeah, yeah, that's, that's correct. That's correct. And to show you that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth, what's easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say take up your mat and walk? And he said, to show you that I have authority on earth to forgive sin. And only God can forgive sins. Take up your mat and walk. And he got up and he walked. And everybody glorified God for what he was doing in their midst. Jesus forgave sins. Muhammad, Buddha, all religious leaders, they do not forgive sins. Muhammad refused to do that. Only Allah does that. Jesus forgave sin. That sets him apart from every other religious leader. How about Matthew chapter 14? Write that one down. And uh, the disciples are out uh, in, uh, in a boat on the Sea of Galilee, and there's this huge storm there. 
and uh, Jesus walks out on the water to them, and they think it's a ghost, and he says, no, it is I, don't be afraid. And then Peter, Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. Come, he says, come. And Peter gets out of the boat and walks on the water, but he takes his eyes off Jesus. He looks at his, the storm and the wind, and you know, like we do in our lives, and then we begin to sing, help me, Lord, save me, Lord, and Jesus lifts him up. Now, when they get into the boat, what do the disciples do? What do they do? They bow and they worship him. Jesus received worship. Again, the religious leaders, nobody would receive worship. Muhammad, oh no, you don't worship me. He received worship. And that means, like C.S. Lewis said, he's either a liar, he is a lunatic, or he is who he said he is. He is the God-man, he is the Lord, and he is Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Yeah. And so, miracles. I, I was sharing with a Muslim, and we were friends for years and years, and we could talk openly about religion. And uh, I said to him one day, I said to this, this Muslim, uh, you know, you guys say that Muhammad performed three miracles. And that's what they say. And, of course, they, they honor Jesus as a great prophet. And they, they follow the Gospels. And, and they see all the hundreds of miracles that Jesus did. And I said to him, so Muhammad did three miracles, you say. Mm-hmm. But yet, in the Gospels, you've got Jesus doing many, many miracles, right? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, don't you think the many, many miracles of Jesus trumps Muhammad's three miracles? And he looked at me, and he said, I never thought about that before. And eventually, we led him to the Lord, and he was baptized. But it was the miracles of Jesus that opened his eyes to the fact that he was unique, that he was unique. Okay, that's, that's proof number one. Now, at the end of the service, I'm going to ask you a quiz, and you've got to give me the answers or we don't leave. All right? So remember miracles, okay? Number one. Okay, number two, the second proof is, begins in verse uh, 25, it fulfilled prophecies. And so what, what he does here, Peter quotes uh, David in Psalm 16, written about a thousand years before the birth of Christ. And he goes through this, 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 this prophecy. And then look at verse 27. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. So it's a, it's a prophecy of of the resurrection. You're going to die. The, the Messiah is going to die, but the Messiah is not, his body's not going to rot. He's going to, he's going to, he's going to die, but his body will not rot. That's a resurrection. And so I want you to know that throughout the Bible, beginning at Genesis 3.15, to the fulfillment of Christ and even through Revelation, there's hundreds and hundreds of fulfilled prophecies. And so what God does the first prophecy of Jesus is in Genesis 3.15. It's called the Proto-Evangelium. It's the first prophecy that God was going to send his son, Messiah, to take care of Adam's sin and his family. And then from Genesis 3.15, you've got this, this huge, these very broad prophecies. And the closer and closer you get to Jesus' birth, these prophecies get very, very specific. Matter of fact, Matthew, who writes to Jews who, who knew these prophecies, you know, he's, he's, he writes, it is written, it is written, it is written. And it's almost like Jesus is fulfilling a script. And he is. Matter of fact, his final week, there's about 50 prophecies he fulfills. And then the, the final 24 hours, within the 50, there's about 24 prophecies that he fulfills. And God is screaming at these Jews. Don't you see? Don't you see? Don't you see? Don't you see? He's the one. 
He's the one. Don't you see he's fulfilling all these prophecies? He's the one. And so there's all these prophecies. And we, this, is, this is powerful. Let me just give you some of these broad, specific uh, Genesis. He's going to be the seed. Messiah will be the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay. Then he'll be a part of the house of David, tribe of Judah. He will be called son of God, son of man. He will be called prophet, priest, and king. He will be born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin. Children will be slain uh, because of his birth. He will flee to Egypt. His ministry will begin in Galilee. He will, he will have a ministry of miracles. He will teach with parables. He will be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. His disciples will flee. He will die and he will raise on the third day. And there's, there's over 200 of these. And so what your assignment is is you can get Josh McDowell's little book on prophecy or whatever, but you need to learn these prophecies, some of these prophecies, and share them with your kids and with your friends. Now, there's a thing called redaction today, and uh, I have skeptic, uh, skeptic friends, and they'll say, well, all those prophecies were fulfilled after the fact of Jesus. That's why they all are fulfilled because they wrote those prophecies after his life, and so, you know, they're all accurate. And you say, no, 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 no. The Dead Sea Scrolls prove that. What are the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, they were found, uh, you know, uh, 1947, 1957, and they, they found all the Old Testament books except for Esther. They carbon dated all those scrolls, carbon dated. Our friends love carbon-14 dating, scientific. We love that. And all of the scrolls, are you writing this down? Are you getting this down? Because I got a quiz. Did I tell you I have a quiz at the end of this? All right, all right, all right. All right. I just want to let you know that. They, da- they carbon dated all the scrolls, and the latest copy was 200 years before the birth of Christ. Okay, everybody take your fist. Come on, come on, take your fist like this and go, yes! Some of you did not do it. You didn't do it? Yes. It's a slam dunk. It's a slam dunk. Would you say to your neighbor, it's a slam dunk? Go ahead. How can you miss on that? How can you miss on that? We just don't know it. We're not sharing it. So learn some of these prophecies. You know, learn 10 or 15 of them. Talk about the Dead Sea Scroll. And then confront them with the truth that God knows the future. And this is proof that the Bible is written by God. There are no errors. All these hundreds of prophecies have been fulfilled to a T. Okay? All right. What's number two, by the way? What did we say the second proof is? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Because th- we got a quiz coming here. Number three, the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Look at verse 29. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on the throne... He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Jesus, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. We are witnesses to the fact. The bodily resurrection of Jesus proves that he is Lord and Savior. It did not happen in a vacuum. Christianity is the only religion that is, that is historically accurate. It's rooted in history. You can go back and check the facts. No other religion is rooted in history. Christianity is. For example, there's no way his body could be stolen. The Muslims say that it was that, um, you know, that, well, they talk about uh, substitution where 
Jesus was so beaten that on the cross, carrying the cross, the disciples then beat Judas for doing what he did and did a substitution that Jesus didn't die on the cross. But anyway, he, he comes up and, of course, he dies. That's a different uh, sermon. But that when he's buried, there's a Roman guard, 16 Roman guards around him, the best in the world. Four groups, four groups march back and forth in front of the tomb. Then you've got four over here, and then you've got four up here, and then you've got four over here. And there is no way that the, this, this stone was sealed with the governor's seal. If the, gov- if the seal was broken, the Roman soldiers are executed. Uh, how about the 500 believers who see Jesus at once? How about his 11 uh, appearances that are just recorded in the New Testament, the resurrection appearances, 11 of them? A, a Saul's conversion, the persecutor, becomes a preacher. That's the greatest evidence, historical evidence for Christianity apart from the resurrection. That Saul, the persecutor, becomes the preacher and writes 13 of the New Testament books. That is proof and evidence that he is alive. But 5,000 believers, he appeared to 5,000 believers at once. 5,000 people do not have the same hallucination. You have 500 people come forward and stand up here at court of law and give the same testimony. That's overwhelming evidence. The apostles are willing to suffer and die for this testimony. And then change lives and the church explodes. The bodily resurrection is the third proof that Jesus is both Lord and Savior. The fourth proof is where we move our friend to from the objective facts. This is where we kind of move them into the the subjective, into their own personal life. And so the fourth proof is exaltation. That's in verse 33. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. You know what David is saying? You know, Folks, everything that you see us doing, miracles and being able to speak in everybody's language, for you to, to hear us and understand all of us in 17, 18 different languages, Jesus is doing this. Jesus is exalted. We saw him uh, rise through the clouds, and he sits at the right hand of God right now, and Jesus is right here watching, and he is performing these miracles and he is touching your heart and he is moving amongst you and he is exalted, he is alive. And this is when you say, and he loves you. He died on the cross for you. He knows the number of hairs upon your head. He knows all of your pain. He knows your loss. He knows what keeps you up at night. He knows your fears. He knows everything about you. And he loves you. He loves you. And he wants you to come under his blood and have all your sins forgiven because he died for you on the cross and he arose and he will take your place as your substitute for all your sins. And he will wash away all your sins. No guilt as far as the east is from the west. All the, everything you've done wrong, he will wash it away. Well, the people were cut to their hearts and they said, well, what must we do to be saved? And Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And... The Holy Spirit, the gift will come into you. And then he said, um, he warned them. He warned them. Oh, I'm afraid I can't talk about hell to people. I'm afraid I'll, I'll offend them. You better talk about hell. Because if they don't come to Christ, they're going to hell. Salvation is found in nobody else but through who? Through Jesus. You better get bold. 
you better start witnessing because your grandparents, your cousins, your friends that you run around with, if they, are not, if they don't have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, they're going to hell. Jesus, though, is willing to die for them. He is willing to pay the price for them. He is willing to remove all their sins so that they can be right with God, a righteous, holy God. We need to be able to baptize them into Christ. All of you should start back, can baptize anybody. You lead somebody to the Lord, baptize them. And then you bring them into the fellowship and you are right there with them and you help them to grow up in the Lord to understand what lordship means. What time do I stop here? Huh? He w- okay, five minutes? Okay. I thought he said 55 minutes. Anyway, this is what he does here. And uh, we should baptize people into Christ. See, this is the, see, how many people do we have here today? I'd say, what? What would you guys say? Hundred? Okay. If every one of you got serious about this and took responsibility for what you're supposed to do, make disciples, in three years, you should lead somebody to the Lord or bring somebody here to this fellowship. We'll give you three years. It's serious, isn't it? And then we'll stop worrying about churches dying and losing people, right? We'll stop worrying about putting on a show with smoke. You need smoke to draw people. You know what I'm saying? Oh, we need smoke. We need this or that to draw them. There is nothing in the Bible that says that an unregenerate, unsaved person is supposed to be drawn to church. Who is responsible to win them? Holy Spirit, but he uses who? Us. And so as we are transformed into the image of Christ, we're changed. We're light. And we love people. We interact with people. And... uh, why are, you, why are you holy? Why don't you do that and this and that and this? Because I'm, I'm, I'm a follower of the Lord. Well, tell me about that. And then you lead them to the Lord. And if just 30% of you took this seriously, because you're right, the Holy Spirit is the one that convicts and so forth. But we have to say it. If just 30% of you did this, And brought somebody to the Lord every year. Would the leadership of this church be satisfied? Would you think 30% growth each year would be pretty good? Yeah. Churches would be begging for that. And it's not about numbers, but it is about numbers. Because numbers are what? People. Individuals. I'm going to relinquish the other 50 minutes to the next service, okay? I was uh, in Louisville, uh, Kentucky, doing I had a ministry there. And um, uh, there was a, uh, uh, one of the members came up to me and said, can you help our family? Uh, we had a teenager pass away, and he doesn't have a minister. Can you help us? So I said, Yeah. And I said, what happened? And he said, well, he was in a boating accident, and that's all, I can, that's all I know. You'll have to go to the funeral home. There'll be two teenagers that will be standing next to the pulpit, and they will be able to tell you exactly what happened. So I said, okay. So I went to the funeral home, and uh, sure enough, there were two teenagers standing next to the pulpit, and... I introduced myself, and I said, tell me about Terry. What happened? And they said, well, we were out on a speedboat on the, on the Ohio River, and if you've ever been to Louisville, it's very, very wide. And we, they, were in, they had their jeans and boots, and it was uh, October-ish, and they had a, you know, just a bunch of heavy clothes on. And they hit a log, 
and it, um, it flipped the boat over, and they said, um, we were about in the middle, and um, Terry's a great swimmer. He, he started swimming toward the Indiana shore, and he got almost to the shore, and he looked back, and we were drowning. We, we, couldn't, we couldn't swim. And so Terry turned back around, swam back out, got underneath us, the two of them, and he pushed them up by their bottom all the way a quarter of a mile to the Indiana shore. When they got to the shore, uh, there was a ladder there, and, and they said, come on, get up there. And he said, no, you go ahead. You, you, you climb up. So they climbed up, and they looked back for Terry to come, and a whirlpool had developed and pulled him under. And he was so exhausted that he could not stay above the water, and he drowned. And so they, I said, is that what happened? Yeah, that, that's what happened. And it got quiet, and one of the boys looked at me, and he looked at Terry, and I, I won't forget this. And he started crying, and he said, I will never be the same. He died for me. And I think that they... Went to school, college. They really wanted to make something of their life. I don't know what happened to them, but that's what he said. I will never be the same. He died for me. And it hit me between the eyes. Wait a minute. I'm in the same boat with with Jesus. I will never be the same because he died for me. Amen? And I'm not going to waste my life. I'm not going to waste it. I'm going to give everything I can to him to serve, to grow, to reach more people for Christ. I will never be the same because he died for me. Amen? Amen. If you need to give your life to Christ, let's do that. And if you need to recommit your life to the message of the gospel, which we've shared, do it. And today, begin to pray daily for 10 people in your circle that need to know the Lord. And God will use you to bring people to Christ. Amen? He will use you. Okay, now what were the four points that Jesus is Lord and Savior? Okay, point number one. Miracles, Miracles, okay. Okay, you did good. Don't say anything. I want to see if they listened. All right, this section here. What's number two? Fulfilled prophecies. You did good. All right, over here, number three. What's the third evidence that Jesus is Lord and Savior? Give each other a high five. (laughs) Okay, everybody, what is the fourth proof that Jesus is Lord and Savior? The exaltation. He's alive, isn't he? And he's here. He's here in this room. And he loves us. He's excited about us. And he wants to use us for his glory. Okay? Do I pray or do we have an invitation or what, what do we do? We have an invitation? Very good. So I'm going to pray And then we'll have an invitation. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with amazing grace. And we just thank you for the evidence that Jesus is Lord and Savior. God, for each one of us, help us to embrace our responsibility to simply share what you have done in our life. You have made us new. You have given us a new life through the gospel of Jesus. May we begin to lead others to Jesus as well. And it's through Jesus.